um, the festival uh, oh, de Santo Tomas. Si, si. Miguel and his young sons show us the story of the conquest by Spanish conquistador Pedro Alvarado, second in command under Cortes. The Maya fought bravely, but were defeated, and Alvarado went on to become the first Spanish governor of Guatemala. Now that's what it's supposed to mean, but actually it's a parody of their submission. Look, they show Alvarado being gored. The Highland Maya have always remained fiercely independent. And the residents of Chichi, among the most independent of all. Meanwhile, Miguel's wife weaves on the back porch using the traditional backstrap. Seeing women weaving with the backstrap in public is rarer now than in the past, but she creates her own patterns. And as we can see, she does beautiful work. In this home, tradition is everywhere. Miguel's son is playing the traditional marimba, different from North American ones. And he keeps company with both Christian and Maya gods. For centuries, villages have had their own special local deities. In Chichi, it's the shrine of Pesquela Bach on the mountain that's important. And Mother Elsie? invites us to see the family's own shrine to Pascuala Bach and the ceremony she performs. See, when the Spanish saw the Maya burning candles and incense and venerating relics, which are all Maya traditions, they realized the practices resembled Catholicism. So they began giving local gods the names of Christian saints in order to convert the people. And now many light candles and pray to the Christian God but do the same for Pascuala Bach, the stone carving that represents the Maya earth god. The Maya belief is that all living beings, including plants and animals, have a soul. They seek harmony with, rather than dominance over nature, a universe that is everywhere alive, with gods and fantastic beings all interconnected, and we humans but a part of this cosmic organism. They have taken those two strands of Christianity and Mayan and have blended them into one. Mark is over and the people are returning home to prepare for the next one in just four days, as they always have. South volcanic mountainsides are patched work with farming. The steep slopes have very rich volcanic ash that make fertile fields. We climb up 4,000 feet to the top, the place of the great water, Lake Atitlan. Aldous Huxley called this the most beautiful lake in the world. It's clear, cold, almost 400 feet deep. It's surrounded by volcanoes and villages. Santiago, home of the Chahuta Hill culture, is the largest. Here, fishing starts early. By midday, the wind they call Chocomil sometimes blows. It can make Atitlan's waters treacherous, and many believe the lake's a spirit, demanding human sacrifice as it did in ancient times. And after seeing their boats, no wonder they're afraid of a sudden wind. Santiago's market, like Chichi Castanengos, draws people from the surrounding hills and the tourist boats from across the lake. The tourist market starts right at the shoreline. All the traditional goods are offered. And by the time most tourists make their way up and down the hill, it's about all they really see of this village before they're ready to start back. But you and I are going to see another life that's going on today, hidden from most outsiders. It's the life of the people, and it's happening several blocks away. At their own market, where they're busy setting up. 
Although few women wear the traditional hail of a headdress now, all wear their embroidery blouses and long wrap skirts in their own village colors and patterns. Listening to a salesman pitching the best of something they can't do without, whatever it is. And looking with a little fear and disgust at this boy's pet iguana. While Santiago's tourist market isn't as large as the one in Chichi Castanango, this local one that's kept separate takes up most of the day. It also takes up most of downtown. And wandering around here, seeing what's being sold, is fascinating. Besides the fresh and dried produce, limestone rocks are a popular buy because this is what the Maya discovered centuries ago. They have to grind and mix with corn in order to make tortilla dough. But as interesting as all the produce and products, there's other things happening in Santiago today that have nothing to do with the market. The narrow streets are filled with people doing their chores by three-wheeled taxis or pickup truck where you get to pay a fee and stand up on the back. Neighborhoods have very small signs or no signs out at all, but people know where they are. On one street, a commercial weaving shop is open and very busy, at least the young weaver is. This is the only commercial weaving shop in Santiago. And the cloth he's creating? It's the same as the bolts of cloth they sell in Guatemala City and all the markets. The cloth so popular for the women's skirts, but these patterns are distinctively from Santiago Village. On some of the streets and narrow alleyways, it's even hard to find the entrances to homes. Many seem quite familiar. Western style rooms. This home even has a little retail shop inside. In back, our friend Sylvan is proud that they even have running water for washing and laundry. An exception here. Most women do their laundry in the lake. And of course, few living rooms are complete without a Christian shrine. The graves in the cemetery also look like shrines, colorfully painted and visited regularly by all of the relatives. This family is gathered today to take care of their own. The main church is also busy its dramatic statues draw some tourists. And the side chapels? They're used continually by those who come for the market. Outside church, a group of men are transporting some of the religious statues to get them ready for an upcoming festival. These men belong to one of Santiago's confradias. Confradias, or fraternities, were introduced by the Spanish missionaries 500 years ago, once auxiliaries to the church. Now some of these brotherhoods are equal or more important in their religion than the church itself. And these same confradias care for another figure that's been an important part of Santiago for hundreds of years. And we're on our way to see the great-grandfather of all the people of Santiago de Atatlan, Massimo, their local deity. He stays in the home of a member of the Confradia that's been given the honor of keeping him company 24 hours every day for one year. 
and a toast to Masaman is offered to everybody who enters the room. It's a way to say thank you to Santiago's God of the Earth, whom they call the spiritual twin brother of Jesus. The Spanish Catholics adopted this Maya God for a while and claimed that from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, while Jesus laid in his tomb, Brother Masamon watched over the earth, protecting it from evil until he arose. And Masamon was kept with the other statues in church. But now, though he's been removed, the Maya continued to honor him with earthly delights of drinks and cigars. And for a contribution, the men will give Masamon himself a drink very carefully. <laughs> However strange this all may seem to outsiders, the commitment of company 24-7 for one year to Masaman is important to these men, for it is he who continues to keep the earth on its appointed course. Our day in this village is now ending, but they will continue as they always have, kept together by traditions, the ruggedness of the land, around the beautiful, mysterious lake they call Atitlan. Our final destination covers about a third of Guatemala, the Pitan region. It's the country's last frontier. While it's poor and paying jobs for the half million who live here, it's rich in wildlife with tropical rainforests and lowland swamps and dry savannas. And it also hides the secrets of more than a hundred Maya cities many still buried underneath the jungle floor. And perhaps the greatest of all, Tikal. The temple of the giant jaguar rises 15 stories, constructed without machines or animals, cutting blocks that were then covered with mortar and painted all red by order of Aakakao, who ruled around 700 AD and whose tomb was discovered inside. The temple looks down on the central plaza where its 100,000 would come for markets. And along one side, the North Acropolis covers over two and a half acres. Buried underneath the 12 temples on top are over a hundred other structures. The courtyard's 70 altars and stelae tell of other leaders with names like Jaguar Paw, Double Comb, Curl Snout. For Tikal was the seat of power for the lords of the great Jaguar clan. And the North Acropolis has also revealed unexpected faces, a 10-foot high mask. Overlooking the other end of the central plaza is the temple another of the 4,000 structures here. It once had a special stairway for the leaders to climb. And what magnificent views it must have offered to the kings and priests as they watched the gatherings below. Just the beginning of this city that spreads out for over 200 square miles more plazas, broad avenues, ball courts, terraces, residential palaces, large and small, all reminders of the over 2,000 year life. But this city's human inhabitants have now been replaced by others, including black vultures that seem to like to mingle with the tourists. Along with wild, oscillated turkeys, 300 other species of birds, and a huge variety of mammals and reptiles like the kudamunde, 
Tikal has some of the richest wildlife in all Guatemala and many disappearing in other places. But living out their daily drama here in what's been called the New York City of Mesoamerica. Scientists will undoubtedly be uncovering the mysteries and secrets of the great ancient Maya civilization for decades. As for their six million descendants, some seriously wonder if they will be able to withstand the technical onslaughts of our modern world. Will the traditional wisdom that's kept them intact so far continue? Or will these people of the Jaguar also dissolve into history?